Hi, I'm Greg Marcus. I'm the pastor of Imperial Valley Christian Center, and this is our Sunday morning church service via the internet. Thank you so much for participating in this with us. We really, really, really appreciate you. Anyway, right now we're talking about the three parts of faith, and we're actually on the third part of faith right now. We're starting with Mark 11, 23, so let's read that real quick. Mark chapter 11, let's start at verse 22, have faith in God, or literally it is have the faith of God, or I would put it have God's faith, you know, possessive, have God's faith. Jesus answered, verse 23, Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes, believes what? That what they say will happen it will be done for them. Hallelujah. So if we can figure out this faith stuff, if we can figure out this believing stuff, if we can figure out how to do this believing thing, if we can figure out what this faith thing is, then Jesus says we'll be able to speak the mountains and move them. If we can just figure out how to believe, what it means to believe, what does Jesus mean by believe? Hallelujah. Then Jesus tells us that we'll be able to speak to mountains and move them. Hallelujah. How, speak to the mountains in our lives, speak to the mountains in, in our neighbor's lives, speak to the mountains in our friends' lives, speak to the mountains in our family's lives, hallelujah, hallelujah, and move those mountains out of their lives, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. So we begin looking at this part where Jesus is teaching about faith in the parable of the sower. So turn over to Luke chapter 8. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 8. Hallelujah. And in verse 4, he put, he's, in verse four it starts with the parable, and then we'll skip down to verse 11, and we'll look at what Jesus says the parable means, just so we have the right context here. So in verse 4, it says this, While a large crowd was gathering, and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told them this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on. The birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground. And when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop. A hundred times more than was sown. When he said this, he called out, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. And then skip down to verse 11. And Jesus says this, this is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path. So he's telling us the seed is the word of God. He's basically, he is a preacher. He's training up his disciples to be preachers, to preach the gospel, to teach the gospel, to teach the word of God. Hallelujah. And he's explaining to them. He's explaining to people, listen, how this faith thing works and how does it work? Well, the the preacher, the teacher sows the seed, but all the seed doesn't produce. The teacher produces, uh, I mean, the teacher sows the seed, but it doesn't all produce a harvest. Hallelujah. And so he's explained that this is a process that we have, that, that there are things that oppose the seed growing, the preacher's seed. Hallelujah. There are things that oppose the the word of God growing. Hallelujah. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. What opposes it from growing? Those along the path are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so they may not believe and be saved. What is the fruit that the seed produces? What is it the seed uh, produces? It produces belief. And the ability to be saved, to be delivered, to be rescued. The seed, the word of God produces faith. The seed, the word of God produces faith. Hallelujah. But there are things that 
come and cause the seed not to produce. Verse 12, those along the path are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. So the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts. Verse 13, those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy. They're excited about it. They love it. Oh, this is wonderful. This is what I've been waiting to hear my whole life, who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while. Hallelujah. They believe for, if you want to receive if you want your faith to develop and grow to the point where it can speak to mountains and move it, you've got to believe for more than just a while. If you want to, your faith to develop, to grow up to the point where it can speak to mountains and move them, you've got to believe for more than just a while. They believe for a while, but in time of testing, they fall away. Hallelujah. So a challenge comes to the Word of God. Something comes to challenge the truth of the Word of God. Something comes to challenge the truth of their faith. Hallelujah. So they believe for a while, but in time of testing, they fall away. Verse 14, the seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. You know, they start, they make this commitment, I'm going to grow in the things of God. I'm going to develop in the things of God. I'm going to start reading my Bible every day. I'm going to start praying every day. I'm going to start meditating in the Word of God every day. I'm going to start going to church every week. Hallelujah. I'm going to grow in the things of God. But then something comes up, not even bad things. You know, oh, we got to go to the school thing. We got to go visit my mom. We got to go do this. It's the softball team. Don't get me started on the softball team. The softball team has travel games on Sundays. We got to travel with them. I guess we're going to miss church on those days. That's what he's talking about. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures. They do not mature. Verse 15, but the seed on good soil stand for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. Hallelujah. So we've been on this first one. Those along are the past ones who hear, then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I'm using as an example of the devil taking the word out of your heart is Greg, me, and the message of prosperity. So we started going to pastor, I've told you a few times before, is we started going to Pastor Price's church, and one of the things he taught us about was prosperity. And he was a Bible teacher. He was just going through the Bible, basically reading it to us, you know, showing us, oh, this is what this means, and this is what that means. Hallelujah. But not based on some theory or some theology or anything, just based on what the Word said. Hallelujah. So he's trying to teach us from the Word of God about prosperity. But when I would hear the Word about prosperity, what would happen? The devil would come and steal the Word out of my heart. How did he steal the way he brought questions and doubts, like Papa Higgins says? As long as you're questioning it and doubting it in your head, never will get in. It couldn't get into my heart because I was questioning it and doubting it in your head. I like to think about it this way now. At the time, I didn't really know how to think about it. At the time, I just kind of felt, ah, oh, this doesn't sound right. This isn't like anything I've heard. I don't know about this stuff. This sounds too good to be true or something like that. Hallelujah. But now I would say what, what's really happening is that we as Christians have a real bad picture of God. We have a real bad picture of God at, be, as the result of Christian traditions and Christian theology and Christian teaching. Hallelujah. And Christian philosophy and Greek uh, philosophy uh, affecting Christian theology. And all those things paint for us a real bad picture of God as God is sort of a, a you know, a guy we want to avoid, a dangerous person. As like I like to think about it, a crazy judge. Imagine, you know, a judge and a jury. Hallelujah. Imagine this crazy judge who can put you in jail, you know, with just the hammer of his gavel. He can send you off to jail. And this is a crazy judge who's ready to sentence people to death for the tiniest little, oh, you, you, uh, you, uh, burped while you were sitting in my courtroom. 
death for you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Things like that. A cra- we te- have this picture of God as this sort of crazy judge who is, you know, super sensitive. And his feelings are very easily offended. You know what I mean? His pride is easily offended. His honor is easily offended. And as a result, he's ready to send people off to death or to be tortured or to be imprisoned for the rest of their life for the smallest, tiniest little infractions. Hallelujah. A crazy judge, hallelujah, but that's the picture that we have of God as this crazy judge. It doesn't occur to us that God wants to help us, that God wants to do things for us, that God wants to uh, prosper us and have us be successful, and God wants us to enjoy our lives. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. God wants good for us. God wants good things for us. Hallelujah. So when Pastor Price began teaching prosperity to us, I rejected it, but Pastor Price also told told us, he taught us, he said, don't take my word for it, you check it out for yourself. So I began this process of studying the Bible. See, is what Pastor Price says really true? Is what Papa Hagen is writing about prosperity, is that really true? Is what Pastor Price teaches about prosperity from the Bible, is that, do these scriptures that Pastor Price quotes, do they really mean that God wants us to prosper, that God wants it to go well with us, that God's interested in our financial needs, hallelujah, that God's interested in our material needs, that he wants to help us with those things? Do these scriptures really mean that? So I began studying, and I told you it took me about 18 years, somewhere between 15 and 18 years, before I finally concluded absolutely without question that the Bible teaches God wants us to prosper. God is not against material things. God is not against material things. He created material things. He's in favor of material things. He likes material things. He's not embarrassed of material things. He's not ashamed of having created material things. Hallelujah, hallelujah. He's not offended us when we desire material things. He created them for us, hallelujah. He wants to be the source for us. He doesn't want the the world to be our source. He doesn't want, uh, you could put it this way, he doesn't want us to follow mammon in order to have our material needs supplied. He doesn't want us to serve mammon in order to get our material desires fulfilled. He wants us to follow him. He wants us to follow him and to serve him to have our material needs provided for, to have our material desires fulfilled. Hallelujah. And that's where people, they're thinking God is like mammon. And so they're turning around. And rather than serving God because of this horrible picture we have of God, I'm trying to tell you what kept the word of God from getting into my heart. I'm trying to tell you about as long as you're questioning it and doubting it in your head and never, what were those questions and doubt? It was this, this horrible picture of God. So as long as we have this horrible picture of God that he's not interested in those things, he doesn't want to help us with those things. He thinks that our our material desires are bad things. Hallelujah. He's embarrassed that he created the world. He's ashamed of having created these material things. He doesn't think they're worth it. He wants us just to focus. As long as that's our picture of God, hallelujah, hallelujah, then guess what most Christians end up doing? They end up serving mammon. They end up serving money. Hallelujah. Why? Because they know God's not interested in their material needs, and they have material needs. They serve mammon because mammon will come up with the money, and they're not too sure that God even wants to know about money. Hallelujah. They serve mammon because mammon comes through. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, mm, they don't they don't even know if he desires to come through. They're kind of think if you ask God for the he's gonna slap you upside the head. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And so you have the vast majority of the Christians serving mammon instead of serving God. Why? Because of this horrible picture that we, that Christian theology and Christian tradition and Christian doctrine and Christian philosophy and Greek uh, theology and Greek philosophy have painted for us of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. A God who's only interested in spiritual things. That isn't a Bible picture of God. That's a 
Greek theological picture of God, a God who's only interested in spiritual things and doesn't think material things are of any value, that's Greek philosophy. That's not Bible. That's Greek philosophy, not Bible. Anyway, so that picture was painted for me and kept the word of Pastor Price is trying to... Uh, trying to teach me the word of God about prosperity. But every time he would uh, sow one of the seeds of the word of God about prosperity, this horrible picture I had of God as not being interested in those things would steal that word out. Those questions and doubts would steal that word out. of The Satan would come to steal the seed out of my heart that Pastor Price was trying to plant. So Pastor Price told us, well, don't take my word for it. Check it out for yourself. So I began studying the Bible. I told you I studied it for about somewhere between 15 and 18 years. Hallelujah. Before I finally discovered, before I finally realized, before I finally came to understand that God is in favor of our material and financial prosperity. And towards the end of that, I was on this scripture, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. Hallelujah. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. I'm just reviewing right now. But remember the Lord your God. Remember Yahweh your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. Well, there it is, wealth. God gives people the ability and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is this day. And so after studying for the, this for quite a while, hallelujah, I came to conclude that it it's saying it means exactly what it's saying. After studying this for quite a while, I came to conclude that it means what it's saying. Hallelujah. God gives power to produce wealth. Hallelujah. And so I would, and I would translate or interpret that verse this way. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms or I would say instead of so confirmed, to keep, to keep the covenant or to keep his promise, which he swore to your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as it is today. But remember the Lord your God, for is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so keeps his promise in order to keep his promise, he gives power to get wealth, in order to keep his promise, which he swore to our ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Hallelujah. 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 In order for God to keep the promise he swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he has to give us power to get wealth. In order for God to keep the promise he swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he has to give us power to get wealth. In order for God to give in order for God to keep the promise that he swore unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He has to give us power to get wealth. Hallelujah. And so I told you, I began looking for that story. Where is this story where God swore to Abraham? He would give him power to get wealth. I'm studying. I'm trying to get my mind to stop rejecting the word of God. I'm trying to get the understand this prosperity. Is this so? Is it really true what Pastor Price is teaching about prosperity? Does God really want you to prosper? Hallelujah. I would like it to be true, but is it true? Is it so? Is it in the Bible? Is the Bible teaching that God wants us to prosper? And here's this scripture that says, but remember Yahweh your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth, in order to keep the promise which he swore to your ancestors as it is this day. But remember, Yahweh your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth in order to keep the promise which he swore to your ancestors as it is this day. So I told you I began looking for that story and I couldn't find it. It wasn't in the Bible. As far as I could tell, there was no place in the Bible where God swore to Abraham he would give him power to get wealth. There was no story in the Bible where God swore to Abraham or Isaac or Jacob that he would give them power to get wealth, as far as I could tell. Hallelujah. And I went through it. And then I told you that I began studying this thing. I was studying on a different subject. I couldn't find the story. I set it aside. And I began studying on the subject of blessing and cursing. And I came across these two definitions while I was studying along that line. You know, the Bible talks about blessing and cursing and Jesus cursed the fig tree, all that kind of stuff. So I'm studying, what does that mean? Is that a real thing? Does that, is that really something that exists? And so in the course of studying that subject, I came across these two definitions. The first from the theological word book of the Old Testament. And it says this, to bless in the Old Testament means to endure with power for success, prosperity, fecundity, which means having lots of children, and longevity, which means long life. 
And then I saw in holidays a concise Hebrew and Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament. He had basically the same thing. He says to uh, his number one definition is God uh, bless equals bestow power for success, prosperity, fertility. His second one, bless equals declare a person endowed with power for success, prosperity, and fertility. Hallelujah. So here were these uh, dictionaries, these lexicons saying that the word bless man meant to endure with power for prosperity, success, lots of children, and long life. These dictionaries, these uh, theological dictionaries, these uh, lexicons of the Bible, hallelujah, were defining bless, blessing, as to endure with power for prosperity, success, lots of children, and long life. To bless means to endure with power for prosperity, success, lots of children, and long life. And it took me a while to get there, but eventually I realized that's where the story was. So let's look at that in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. And this is the story of Abraham. This is where it begins. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord Yahweh had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. And I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Verse four, so Abram went as the Lord had told him. Hallelujah. But go back to verse two. And I will make you into, do what I tell you to do, basically is what God is telling us. Go from your country, your people, your father's household to the land I will show you. Go where I tell you to go. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. Let, well, if I insert the definition from the holiday, a concise Hebrew and Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament into that, it means this, I will bless you, means I will bestow power for success, prosperity, and fertility on you. I will bestow power for prosperity, success, success, prosperity, and fertility on you. If I substitute the theological word book for the Old Testament definition, it says this, uh, Instead of, I will bless you, I will endue you with power for success, prosperity, lots of children, and long life. Hallelujah. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will endue you with power for prosperity, success, lots of children, and long life. So that was the story. God had promised Abraham. Hallelujah. Later, he, 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 come, he adds to it. He swears a covenant to Abraham, but on the same thing, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will endue you with pros I will endue you with power for success, prosperity, lots of children, and long life. I will endue you with power for prosperity, success, lots of children, and long life. Can you see how that explains the story? of Deuteronomy 8, 18, but thou shalt remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth in order to confirm the covenant, in order to establish the covenant, in order to keep the promise which he swore to your fathers. Which fathers? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. And you can tell that's what blessing means because that's what happened to Abraham and his descendants. You can tell that the definition from the theological word book of the Old Testament and from a concise Hebrew and Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament, that their definition of blessing is correct because that's exactly what happened to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God gave them power to get wealth. And it wasn't even like, you know, they worked real hard and they got wealthy. No, these were supernatural powers to get wealth. God was giving them supernatural power to get wealth. You know, people like to say here in the United States, they say, oh, well, if you just work hard, you'll get, I don't know. I know lots of people work super hard, never get anything. I know lots of people work super hard, harder than you or I could ever imagine. Back breaking hard labor, hallelujah, who never have anything, hallelujah. So that promise uh, can't be talking about back breaking hard labor. And when we look at it, it turns out that the prosperity that comes with the blessing, he gives us power to get wealth, hallelujah. But thou shalt remember Yahweh your God 
For it is he that gives you power to get wealth. He's not talking about physical muscle power. He's not talking about the life that he's giving you power. He's talking about supernatural power. Hallelujah. Look, let's look first at Genesis chapter 24. Genesis chapter 24, verse 34. So he said, I am Abraham's servant. And this is the story of Abraham sending his servant back to the old country to get a wife for his son, the wife that turned his son Isaac, that the wife turned out to be Rebekah. Hallelujah. And so now the servant is back in the old country. He's introducing, he's looking for the relatives of Abraham. He's introducing himself to them. So they're, you know, the same tribe of Abraham. He's trying and, and he just happens across them. God leads him to them while, while Rebecca is out uh, getting water from the well. And so he begins to tell her. So he said, I am Abraham's servant. Abraham's servant. The Lord has blessed my master abundantly and he has become wealthy. The Lord, Yahweh, that's the name of God. Yahweh, that God, you, you guys know, you remember that Abraham left here to go serve Yahweh? You remember that Yahweh God that Abraham went to serve? God, Yahweh spoke to him, told him, go to the land and I will bless you. And then he, and Yahweh has blessed my master abundantly and he has become wealthy. He has given him sheep and cattle, silver and gold, male and female servants and camels and donkeys. My master's wife, Sarah, has borne him a son, Isaac, in her old age when it was impossible for them to have kids. What did God promise? I'll bless you. I'll do you with power for prosperity, success, lots of children and long life. Hallelujah. I'll do you with power for prosperity, success, lots of children, and long life. And here, even when they were old, it was supernatural that this promise of blessing came to pass. Watch, look at this one. Turn over to Genesis chapter 26. Genesis chapter 26, verse 1. This is the story of Isaac. Now, there was a famine in the land. What's a famine? And then we would call it a recession or a depression. Now there was a famine, there was a depression, a recession in the land. Besides the previous famine in Abraham's time, and Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, and Gerar. Verse 2, the Lord Yahweh appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt, live in the land where I tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while. In other words, stay in the land of the famine instead of going to Egypt where they, you know, they have a big river that they use to irrigate their crops and stuff, to feed their animals and stuff. Hallelujah. You stay here in this desert land that's experiencing a famine. <laughs> that's what he's telling him. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while and I will be with you and will Bless you. What is blessed? I will do you with power for prosperity, success, lots of children, and long life. For to you and to your descendants, I will give all these lands and will confirm the oath I swore to your father, Abraham. I will make your descendants as numerous. I got to go quickly here. And then in verse 6, it says, So Isaac stayed in Gerar. You can read the rest, but skip down to verse 12. And it says this. I, I, I want you to see that God prospered Isaac in a supernatural way. It was supernatural power for prosperity that God is promising. It's supernatural. He's not talking about working hard. He's not talking about working 24-7. He's not talking about doing backbreaking liquor. He's not talking about having three jobs. Hallelujah. So you can survive. No, he's talking about supernatural. God give him prosperity. Hallelujah. Not man's strength prosperity, God power prosperity. Not man's ability prosperity, God's power prosperity. Not man's hard work prosperity, God's power prosperity. Verse 12, Isaac, remember there's a famine in the land. Verse 12, Isaac planted crops in that land and the same year reaped a hundredfold. That means a hundred times. 
Hallelujah. So it was a huge crop. It was a hundredfold crop. It was the big crop. It was the massive crop. Here they are in a famine. And guess who has a hundredfold crop? Hallelujah. That's supernatural power to prosper. Hallelujah. When in the famine time, you're not supposed to have a good crop. Your crops are supposed to die off. Hallelujah. Much less are you supposed to have a hundredfold crop, a hundred times crop, not the big bumper crop. Hallelujah. No, hallelujah. That's God's power. That's God's supernatural power for prosperity working there. Isaac planted crops in that land in the same year, reaped a hundredfold because Yahweh blessed him. The man became rich and his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. He had so many flocks and herds and servants that the Philistines envied him. All I want you to see is that that's, they, that's what the word blessed means. It means that. The man became rich and his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. The man became rich and his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. That's that promise. Remember Deuteronomy 8.18? But thou shalt remember Yahweh your God, for it is he who giveth thee power. He'll give you power to get wealth in order to keep the promise he made unto your fathers, Abraham, Isaac. And you see, Abraham became supernaturally wealthy. You can see Isaac becoming supernaturally wealthy. Now turn over to Genesis chapter 30. This is a real long one, and I can't go through the whole thing here. But you, you know, look it up for yourselves. This is a story of when, uh, you know, Jacob had gone to live with his uncle back in the old country. And his uncle was kind of a conniving old guy, you know, like uncles are sometimes. And he, he began tricking uh, uh, Jacob and all these things. And finally, uh, Jacob was going to take off. But then God showed him, hallelujah, how he could supernaturally prosper. Hallelujah. And so he, Jacob began believing God. Jacob began believing God that his sheep would come out spotted and speckled. Hallelujah. Because his boss, Laban, was going to get all the plain animals, the plain white animals, the plain black animals. But the ones with spots on them or streaks on them or anything, hallelujah, those were going to be Hallelujah, Jacob's. So he began believing God, hallelujah, that the big strong animals, when they gave birth, they'd give spotted and speckled animals. Hallelujah. And the little weak animal, yeah, he can have the little weak, <laughs> plain, plain color animals. Hallelujah. And so that story concludes in this way in verse 43. And there's more details than that, but I don't have time to look at it right now. And it's really one of my favorite stories in the Bible. There's things I want to show you from that about faith about believing, about Jacob believing God. Hallelujah. But it concludes here in verse 30, in chapter 30, verse 43. In this way, the man grew exceedingly prosperous and came to own large flocks and female and male servants and camels and do donkeys. In this way, in this supernatural way, the man grew exceedingly prosperous. In this supernatural way, the man grew exceeding, not just prosper, exceedingly prosperous. The promise, God's promise to prosper us, God's promise to give us power to get wealth is a promise of supernatural ability to produce wealth. Wealth that comes from God, not wealth that comes from the work of our hands. Hallelujah. Wealth that comes from the power of God, not wealth that comes from our hard work. Hallelujah. Was, oh, yes, this was all the result of my hard work. Well, good for you, knucklehead. Hallelujah. Good. For, but God's prosperity comes from supernatural power of God. Look over here. Let me show you that in Proverbs chapter. Hallelujah. Look at verse 22 here. And it says, the blessing of Yahweh, the blessing of the Lord. The reason I, I, I say Yahweh instead of the Lord is because I want you to see that's, that's who spoke to Abraham. The blessing of Yahweh, the blessing of the Lord brings wealth without painful toil for it. Hallelujah. The first thing I want, to, I want you to see here is that the children of Israel, through their history, they could see, hallelujah, that when God blessed you, you became wealthy. That when God blessed you, you became wealthy. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah. You can see it in the story of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When God blessed them, what happened to them? They became wealthy. The blessing of Yahweh brings wealth. The blessing of Yahweh. So God must not be against wealth, right? The blessing of Yahweh brings wealth. Hallelujah. God must not be against wealth. God, if God blesses you and it brings wealth, that means God thinks wealth is a good thing. If God blesses you and it brings wealth, that means God thinks wealth is a good thing. Hallelujah. But now look at the second part, without painful toil for it. Hallelujah. He's not saying you shouldn't work. Hallelujah. Yeah, go work. But work is not the source of your wealth. Hallelujah. Go and work. Go have your job. You know, get your monies, whatever. But wealth is not, but work is not the, the painful toil is not going to be the source of your wealth. The wealth is going to come from believing God. It's going to come from God's supernatural power causing wealth to come to you when you learn to walk by faith. Hallelujah. 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 The blessing of the Lord brings wealth without painful toil for it. Hallelujah. God wants you to be blessed. God wants you to have wealth, hallelujah, without painful toil for it. God wants to bring you supernatural power for wealth, hallelujah. How does he do that? By learning to believe God, by learning to walk by faith, hallelujah. Unfortunately, I'm out of time, but I'm not finished. So please come back next week. Thank you so much for being a part of this with us. We really, really appreciate your being, joining with us in these services. And uh, if you want to learn more, you can go to our website, www.ivchristiancenter.com. You can also contribute, give an offering, give a donation. Keep this ministry going at our website by clicking on the Feed the Ox button and you'll be able to give a donation through PayPal. Thank you so much for those of you who support our ministry and keep it going. We really, really, really appreciate you. I'll see you later. Bye-bye.